So people are now entering and we should then give it a moment until we see that people have had a chance to join. So good evening, everyone. We're just waiting a couple of minutes while people join uh, and then we'll get started. So good evening. It looks like the, the numbers have stabilised. So uh, good afternoon, uh, Lucien in Waterloo. Good evening, everybody in Ireland. Uh, I'm Adrian Otterall. I'm Professor of Mathematical Physics here at UCD. And I'm delighted to welcome you to UCD's virtual campus for the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies School of Theoretical Physics Statutory Public Lecture for 2021. Our lecture this evening is entitled Quantum Quest and comes at an extremely exciting time for everything quantum in Ireland. This week, the European Quantum Technologies Conference of the 1 billion euro EU quantum flagship project is being hosted virtually in the Dublin Convention Center under the leadership of the Irish Center for High End Computing. While earlier this year, we celebrated the launch of the UCD Center for Quantum Engineering, Science and Technology, appropriately shortened to Sequest. Yet, while all of these advances are going on, the old age adage of shut up and calculate may now have extended to shut up and build a quantum computer, but there still remains a fundamental tension at the heart of theoretical physics. We have two great theories, Einstein's theory of general relativity, that tells us that gravity is expressed through a curved four-dimensional space-time with the curvature determined by the energy density at a point in space-time. And we have quantum mechanics where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle cells tells us that it doesn't make sense to talk about energy at a point in space-time. This tension and the associated desire to formulate a quantum theory of gravity has inspired many leading thinkers in theoretical physics over the last century. And we're delighted to have one such in our speaker this evening. Professor Lucien Hardy is currently in the faculty on the faculty of the world-famous Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics, uh, based in the Quantum Foundations Group. He previously held prestigious positions at Oxford, La, La Sapienza, Durham, Innsbruck, and Maynooth University, 
back in the days when it was still known as Maynooth College. His research focuses on operational approaches to quantum theory, quantum field theory, general relativity, and quantum gravity. So without further ado, uh, so with one bit of further ado, let me just explain the format here that we have a Zoom webinar. So you won't be able to uh, address questions, but please directly, but please enter questions into the Q&A box and we will then address those to Professor Hardy uh, at the end, or at least as many as we have time for in, in the limited time available to us. But now, without further ado, let me pass the floor to Lucian to deliver the Dias School of Theoretical Physics Statutory for Public Lecture 2021 on the theme of Quantum Quest. Uh, thank you very much. So it's it's a great uh, pleasure to give this talk. I, I, I do wish I was there uh, in, in Dublin uh, delivering it uh, in person, um, but I'm very glad to be doing this uh, over Zoom. Um, uh, in any case, I have very happy memories of, of the year I spent uh, uh, living in, in Ireland. I lived most of that time uh, in, in Dublin. Um, um, and I visited um, both um, both the Dublin Institute uh, and also uh, UCD uh, on a number of occasions. Um, I'm going to share my uh, slides. Um, let's see if this works. OK. Um, so uh, I, I entitled uh, this uh, Quantum Quest. And I didn't realize at the time that there is a film called Quantum Quest. I think it's one of those films they play at some kind of space center and it has people like Samuel L. Jackson, uh, James L. Jones, and it even has Neil Armstrong uh, in it. So um, that may be a better thing to watch. <laughs> um, uh, so as, uh, as Adrian said, um, there are these two great uh, pillars of physics uh, today, uh, and they both date back to the early part of the last century. Uh, and they are general relativity, this is Einstein's theory of gravity from 1915, uh, and uh, quantum theory, uh, which was uh, invented by uh, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, uh, and others uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and these two uh, theories, uh, they don't fit together. Uh, they're sort of conceptually and mathematically different. They do not uh, go together as you would like. And so this uh, leads to uh, what I would call the, the problem of quantum gravity. The problem of quantum gravity is to find some new theory, it may be a, more, a deeper, more fundamental theory, uh, that approximates to general relativity and also to quantum theory in uh, appropriate, appropriate circumstances. Um, and so I, I've sort of represented that here. You want to find this new theory, and then I've drawn arrows to two of the older theories. So a newer, deeper, more fundamental theory approximating to these uh, older, uh, less fundamental theories. Uh, and this problem is really the, um, the holy grail of uh, modern um, theoretical physics. Um, so before I talk about that, let me talk about uh, Dublin uh, to Maynooth. Uh, so like I said, I, I lived um, in Dublin uh, and I worked at Maynooth and uh, every day I would catch the bus. Uh, I managed to find the bus shelter I used to catch the bus from uh, in Dublin on Google Maps, Google Street View. Uh, and then there's a sort of nice picture of uh, the older part of Maynooth uh, College, as it was known back then. Um, and, um, and I used to catch the number 66 bus uh, to Maynooth. And I mention this because um, it, uh, uses, it helps illustrate a, a basic idea. So when the number 66 uh, bus is moving steadily, uh, along a straight road, uh, then you could say we're in an inertial frame of reference. It feels on the bus uh, just like you're sitting at home in your front living room. That's not really true because the bus would be a bit jittery. But let's, let's just imagine that the road is per perfectly smooth, everything is smooth, the bus is moving steadily, then you could just as well be drinking your cup of tea uh, without uh, too much concern on that bus uh, as you would were you sitting at home uh, uh, in, your, in your living room. Um, uh, however, when the bus uh, goes around a corner or when the driver slams on uh, the brakes, um, so the, the speed changes, uh, then we are in uh, what might be called a, a non-inertial frame of reference. Uh, and in that case, it would be quite difficult to drink uh, your cup of tea, you know, it would spill. Um, 
one thing we can do is attach a coordinate system uh, to a frame of reference. So for example, we could say that, uh, here's, here's a picture of a coordinate system. We could measure distance along the length of the bus and call that the Y coordinate. We could measure distance across the, uh, across the width of the bus and call that the X coordinate and distance um, uh, along the height of the bus and call that the Z coordinate. You can attach these coordinates uh, to frames of reference, like a bus or, or, or whatever you want, really. Um, so um, if you're in an inertial frame of reference, uh, like the bus, then um, objects tend to move in, a, or move in a straight line with constant speed, unless they're acted upon by some external force, which stops them doing that. And if you're in a non-inertial frame of reference, uh, then objects uh, will move along curved uh, lines uh, in, in that um, frame of reference, uh, unless they're acted upon by some force that stops them doing that. Uh, one way to know that you're in an inertial frame of reference, sorry, in a non-inertial frame of reference is to see that people are screaming. Um, the more non-inertial it is, the more people will scream. And here's a picture of, I believe that's Britney Spears uh, in the front row there uh, on, a roller, on a roller coaster. Okay, so in the first part of this talk, I want to talk not, not about the quantum quest, but about what I would call the, the great classical quest. So I'll begin this story with uh, Newton, although I equally might have begun it with, um, with uh, Kepler or with uh, Galileo. And I'll end it with uh, Einstein's invention of general relativity. <clears throat> So um, here's uh, Newton in 18, sorry, in 1687, uh, he came up with his theory of gravity. Now, there's a, when, you, when you want, one's giving a public talk, there's a general sort of uh, wisdom that you shouldn't put any equations in the talk. Every equation you put in will lose 50% uh, of the audience. However, I thought if I put all the equations in on t-shirts and things like that, then it wouldn't be so bad. Uh, you don't have to understand any of the equations. Uh, I just put them there so you can see them. Uh, this is the equation that uh, Newton uh, wrote down for his theory of gravity. And it tells you that the force between two bodies um, is uh, proportional to um, the, the product of the masses between them. You multiply the mass of body one and body two, and, and that gives you the strength of the force. And then also it's, um, it, it, it decreases as the square of the distance between them. Okay, so the further away, the weaker the force. And um, there's, um, there were two problems with uh, Newton's theory of gravity. First of all, you had instantaneous action at a distance. So two masses would, if you move one, then the other one be, would be instantly influenced, even though the two masses were far away from each other. And also, there was no mediating influence. There was nothing in between the two masses that was causing this force to be mediated. Um, and that was very unfamiliar. Uh, uh, to people at the time. And uh, people didn't like it. Uh, um, many people were bothered by it, uh, including um, uh, Newton himself. So he wrote, um, well, actually, I, I'm not going to read this whole quote out, but he, he wrote um, uh, the, the, uh, um, that the idea uh, that uh, you could have action at a distance without a mediating uh, uh, substance uh, is to him so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has, in philosophical matters, a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Uh, I, I like this because it's a very delicate way of calling somebody uh, crazy. Uh, so what he was saying really was, you'd have to be crazy to believe in action at a distance uh, with nothing mediating the force. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, characters uh, in sitcom history. Um, so, um, so what to do about that? Well, you know, I, uh, Newton uh, and, and other people in the day were, were very good physicists, so they set about trying to solve this problem. Uh, and they invented lots of uh, mechanical explanations of, of, of gravity. In fact, uh, René Descartes was doing that even before Newton wrote down his, uh, his uh, universal law of gravitation, with the equation I just showed you. So René Descartes had this theory where there was uh, an ether, this is a substance filling all of space throughout the entire universe, uh, and there would be these vortices, uh, and he had a very intricate explanation of how 
the, 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 the substance, this ether, could cause um, um, bigger uh, masses, bigger bodies, to be moved around uh, and uh, thereby account for, um, for example, the fact that the Earth goes around the sun. Um, Newton had an idea um, that was uh, based on the same physics that was, that was later discovered by uh, Bernoulli, uh, and this is the physics that makes airplanes fly. Uh, so the idea he had uh, was, um, was the, 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 the force that was acting on, on planets and apples uh, was um, because of this, uh, this effect that makes an airplane fly, that if you have uh, particles in the ether, in his case, moving faster on one side than the other, then this could uh, put a force on, on the planet or the apple and make it move in a certain direction. Uh, and there, there were many of these uh, 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 mechanical explanations. A particularly famous one uh, was by this guy, Nicolas Fatia de Dullier, um, uh, who had the idea that there were these small particles moving in all directions, uh, and if you had two bodies, then they would absorb some of these particles, and so you would get a shadow uh, on another matter. So, so you have you see this picture here. Um, this this body is absorbing some of the particles, so there are a few of them arriving over here, and this means that there are more particles hitting the um, the mass on this side than this side, and so it would end up being pushed towards the other mass. Um, and uh, he even believed he had experimental evidence of this. So here's a photograph of uh, the phenomenon known as zodiacal light. If you look over the horizon uh, before the sun comes up, so you, you won't be able to see any direct light coming from the sun, but you can see nevertheless light that's been scattered off, uh, off these, uh, off these, um, these the very small particles that are, that are there uh, near the sun. Um, so uh, uh, Fatio came up with the correct explanation of this phenomenon known as zodiacal light. Okay. Um, and he thought that these particles were the particles here. That was wrong, of course. Um, okay, so that was the story of gravity. Now I want to fast forward um, uh, uh, a few hundred years uh, to uh, when people were starting to think about electricity and magnetism. And there were lots of people involved in, 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 um, in that search. Uh, here's a, a picture of uh, Michael Faraday. Uh, and in 1850, sorry, 1856, uh, he invented uh, the important concept of a field. Uh, so what he did was he took, he took a magnet, he put a, a, a U-shaped magnet, he put a card on top of it, and he sprinkled um, uh, iron filings all over the, um, uh, all over the card. And then these iron filings would assume a pattern. They would assume the pattern like in this uh, picture here. Uh, and he put this whole apparatus inside a vacuum tube and sucked out all the air. And even, even when he did that, there was still this pattern. And he said, what must be happening is there is some kind of field, a magnetic field, that's causing uh, the filings to be arranged in this way. So a field is some physical, um, uh, some physical property that exists at each point uh, in space. Uh, and this was a very important uh, concept. Uh, I think one of the reasons that Einstein had such great admiration for, for Faraday was because he invented this uh, important concept of a field. Well, um, um, in, uh, uh, not too many years later, uh, James Clerk Maxwell uh, published, so Clark Maxwell published his uh, equations for electric and magnetic fields. Um, so he published, uh, in, a, in a book, he published something like 20 equations uh, for, uh, for, for uh, electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and these equations were simplified by this remarkable individual called Oliver Heaviside uh, into the four equations um, uh, which uh, we know today. So these are uh, usually called Maxwell's equations, but actually they're the ones that uh, 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 simplified by, these are the ones simplified by uh, Oliver Heaviside. Um, and, and these would be the equations that Einstein uh, learned about some years later when he got very excited uh, about electromagnetism. Of course, he didn't have this cup. He, he learned about them in a textbook. Um, so, um, so that was um, Maxwell's equations. Now, what was interesting was that Maxwell um, um, discovered his equations, he derived his equations using this idea that there was an ether. 
an elastic medium that uh, was present throughout the universe, um, um, which had uh, which had some sort of mechanical structure. Here's a picture. Don't ask me to explain this in any great detail, uh, but there were sort of vortices and smaller gear wheel particles. And he used this picture this, uh, of an ether to derive his equations. Uh, and then he thought, well, this is an elastic medium, so therefore there must be it must be possible to send waves through it. And so he calculated his the um, the, um, the speed of these waves. Uh, and he did this when he was uh, in, in Scotland, uh, and he got an expression, a mathematical expression, but he didn't have the numbers to put into that expression. And he was at a family function at the, the time, and he was stuck in Scotland for, for a month. And then um, when, when this was over, he was able to get down to London, to, to his flat in London, where he had the actual numerical value of these constants. Um, these were constants from the theory of magnetism and from the theory of... Um, of electric phenomena. And he stuck those constants into his equation, and remarkably, the speed he got was the speed of light. Um, and so this was an incredible discovery. Um, so here, here's a quote from, um, from, um, from um, Maxwell at the time. We can scarcely avoid the inference that light consists in the transverse undulations of the same medium, which is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. Okay, so this, this is somebody who's incredibly excited. You know, if I discovered this, I would be doing a, uh, doing a happy dance and uh, publishing it on TikTok. Um, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is how Maxwell expressed his excitement. Um, okay. Well, people started to ask questions about this ether. And they said, well, surely if the Earth is moving with respect to the ether, um, then, um, then the light, sh then the light speed should vary during the course of the year. So if, if the earth is moving, um, in the direction is, is, if, if, if you measure the speed of light in the same direction, the earth is moving, uh, then you would subtract the speed of the earth, uh, with respect to the ether, uh, from, from the, um, the speed you get, and you'd expect to get a slower speed for the speed of light. And if uh, the earth is moving in the opposite direction, you'd expect to get a bigger speed. Um, so, um, so if the speed of light is, is measured is, is, is some constant relative to the ether, then if you're moving in the ether, you'd expect to see that speed varying, varying. Uh, and as the Earth goes around the sun uh, in the course of the year, uh, you'd expect it to vary um, annually. So, um, so two very careful experimentalists did an experiment uh, in uh, 1887. They put this apparatus; it was a, a light interferometer. Uh, on a table and then floated that on 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 um, on mercury, a big a big uh, vat of mercury to keep it stable, uh, and they were able to show that actually the speed of light doesn't change; the speed of light stays constant uh, during the course of the year. Um, and this was a big shock. Um, how can the speed of light stay constant uh, if we're moving through the ether? Surely it must um, vary. Well, um, one clue on how to understand this came from uh, George Francis Fitzgerald. Uh, he was at, uh, well, the other institution, he was at TCD. Um, um, uh, and he wrote um, that, uh, or basically his idea was that the only way you could explain this was if the length of material bodies uh, changes when they're moving through the, um, through the ether. So the idea is that speed is uh, distance divided by time. And uh, if the speed doesn't change when it's should, then the only way to explain that is so if, is if something else has to give. And the idea was that the length of material bodies uh, changes uh, as you're moving through the ether. And he gave some theoretical support to that idea. He knew from his calculations using Maxwell's equations uh, that electric, um, <coughs> electric forces are affected by the motion of bodies. And so he thought this should happen also with um, with um, things like rulers. Now, in, in the, the next few years, um, various people um, um, were able to show that this was indeed the case. And um, not only did um, distance intervals change <clears throat> under motion, but also time intervals. <clears throat> and, um, and, and this was all consistent with Maxwell's equations. 
Now, all these people um, were still thinking in terms of there being an ether. So the idea was that um, the, if you moved with respect to the ether, then a ruler would get shorter uh, and a clock would go slower. <clears throat> um, but there was still this ether, this um, elastic medium throughout the entire universe. And that was what people understood. And then along came Einstein in 1905, and he completely changed that. He took a very different point of view. So he, um, as I said, was um, uh, very interested in um, Maxwell's equations. Um, and he studied them carefully. And he realized there was a way to derive the ways in which these lengths and times, these length intervals and time intervals should change um, by starting with two very basic postulates. These are the two postulates. One postulate, the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. The second postulate, the speed of light is the same in any inertial reference frame. Remember, an inertial reference frame is when the, um, the 66 bus to Minuk is moving steadily. Um, so from these two postulates, he was able to derive the correct uh, equations for how length and time uh, um, behaved. Um, uh, and, and also he derived his famous uh, equation E equals MC squared. Um, but he'd done something different. See, now he said the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. Whereas previously, people said there was this elastic medium that was uh, throughout the entire universe that provided a special frame of reference where things were still. And so, <clears throat> just like that, um, he had abandoned the ether. Okay, the ether was gone. It no longer had any place in, in physics. Uh, and that's uh, the, the modern point of view. And it's interesting that over centuries, people had spent um, time doing very difficult calculations with respect to these very elaborate mechanical models. And suddenly, this was all gone. It wasn't necessary. OK. So if you go to 1905, when Einstein had um, written down his theory of special relativity, there were really two great pillars of physics. There was Newton's theory of gravity uh, from 1687. Um, and there was um, the special relativistic field theory. So this was um, the theory of special relativity applied to Maxwell's equations and any other physical equations you might write down. You can also write down the equations for fluid dynamics in special relativistic form. So, so there are these two, um, these two great uh, pillars of physics, and these two great theories uh, did not fit together. That was the situation in 1905. Um, and this you could describe here as the problem was uh, the, the problem of relativistic gravity. You needed to find a theory that was consistent with special relativity uh, that would approximate the theories of special relativity like um, Maxwell's equations on the one hand and also uh, uh, approximate Newtonian gravity on the other hand. Uh, this problem was solved by Einstein in 1915 in the form of his theory of general relativity. Uh, and what he did was he found a new and more fundamental theory um, that accounted for or that approximated these two less fundamental theories. In this new fundamental theory, uh, the gravitational force is no longer instantaneous. It's mediated uh, by a, a gravitational field, it's called the metric field, that lives in, in space-time. Um, so general relativity is not a mechanical ether model. Uh, there's no sort of cogs and wheels and uh, something like that. Um, it, it's a sort of fundamental theory of uh, fields. Uh, here's a photograph uh, which I, I believe was um, taken shortly after he had achieved um, this um, milestone in 1915. Uh, and um, in coming up with the theory of general relativity, he had just uh, completed what I would argue is the most remarkable feat in intellectual history. It's, it's really a, a very um, beautiful theory. Uh, how did he do this? Well, it started for him uh, with uh, the equivalence principle. He described this as the happiest thought of uh, his life. And here's the idea of uh, the equivalence principle. Um, 
you imagine that you have a man inside uh, an elevator or a box, uh, and he, maybe he's got some objects like here, I think is an apple or something. Uh, and the box is either falling freely towards the earth, or it's floating out in space. Uh, and the equivalence principle says that those two situations are the same. There's no way inside the elevator that you could know uh, which of those two situations is you're in. If you're in the elevator and it's falling to earth, then everything inside the box is falling at the same time. Uh, and so it will just be floating relative to you. You'll feel like you're floating out in space. Uh, and if you're floating out in space, well, you'll be floating out in space. Um, so this was the um, equivalence principle, and it was um, Einstein's starting point. Um, uh, inside the elevator, everything is moving in a straight line, uh, and so what you have is inertial behavior. So inside the elevator, everything is inertial. Um, and um, oh, here's, here's a, a picture of Stephen Hawking. He, he got um, to go into, uh, into, into a, a sort of zero gravity um, um, a situation. So he was in an airplane, and the airplane sort of dives towards um, Earth for a while, and, and then everybody inside is floating, and they experience zero gravity. So this would be an inertial frame of reference. Um, and uh, you can take Einstein's equivalence principle and uh, write it in a different way. You can say, uh, that there always exists a coordinate system with respect to which we have inertial physics in the local vicinity of any point. Um, that's a slightly different way of saying the same thing I said before. Uh, you can attach a coordinate system to the aeroplane, uh, so the, the coordinate system is falling at the same speed as the aeroplane, and then in that coordinate system, all the physics is inertial. And you can see that uh, Stephen Hawking is not screaming. Um, okay. Well, so the, the, the equivalence principle was, was the, the starting point uh, for Einstein, but there was still a, a lot more work to be done. It wasn't until 1915 that he actually finally came up, came up with um, his uh, famous uh, field equations. And one development which influenced him uh, was uh, the work of um, Hermann Minkowski, uh, so he came up with the idea that um, you have to think of space and time as as a four-dimensional entity, a kind of single entity that's uh, four-dimensional. There's this um, beautiful quote from Minkowski. He says, henceforth, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Um, Einstein didn't like this point of view at first, but he very quickly uh, adopted the point of view uh, as he was uh, developing general relativity. And then uh, there's other geometric, um, um, other geometric ideas that um, Einstein learned about. So, um, so Bernhard uh, Riemann had, um, uh, and other people had developed um, um, uh, this this theory of of curved space. Uh, Back, uh, uh, back in you know, sort of eight, in the mid eighteen hundreds, uh, and what happens in curved space is that the usual properties that you have uh, in in uh, in geometry uh, start to go away. So here's a triangle. You can see that if you add together the angles in this triangle, you'll get less than one hundred and eighty degrees. And here are two lines which look like they're parallel, but as you go further away from here, they start to diverge, whereas parallel lines would normally uh, stay the same distance from one another. Um, so Einstein learned about this uh, field of mathematics through uh, his his uh, 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 friend uh, Marcel Grossman. He'd known him uh, since school, uh, and they wrote a paper uh, in uh, 1913 where they they put down the sort of basic the, the beginning ideas for uh, a theory of general relativity. And the theory, the theory of um, general relativity um, is, is like this. You have uh, space-time, and space-time gets to be curved. Uh, and, and, and what curves it is mass. So um, if you have bodies like, um, and really it's mass energy, but you have, if you have bodies like planets or, um, or stars or whatever, black holes, they will cause um, space-time to be curved. 
Um, and then if those bodies are moving around, then the way they move is influenced by the curvature of the space-time. So John Wheeler put it in this very simple way. He said, space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. Um, well, when space-time curves, uh, you're um, affecting something called causal structure. What is causal structure? Well, the pattern of before and after is, is called causal structure. So here's an example. Um, if you start down at the bottom of the diagram, five men get into a car at hideout. Four jump out at a, at a bank. Then you've got over here, three enter the bank, one goes to lookout post, one drives car to side exit. Okay, over here, three grab money. Uh, uh, the one at the, uh, the side, at the lookout post uh, goes to the car at the side exit. So now two are in the side exit. And then at the end, five uh, 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 are in the car and it starts speeding away. Okay, so there is a series of events that happen in, in space and time. And you can see they have a causal order. Uh, there's a pattern of before and after between these events. Uh, and the causal order in general relativity uh, is affected by the curvature of space-time. And what that means is that causal structure depends on the distribution of, of matter. Um, hence, the causal structure, the pattern of before and after, uh, is not fixed. It's dynamical. It's something that changes. And this is, uh, this is a sort of radical different thing you get with general relativity compared with um, the physics that came before. Um, so, um, I, 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 those of you that are parents will have had the experience of trying to get your children to sleep, uh, and out of desperation, I'm sure, I'm sure like me, you, you came up with songs. Here's a song um, I, I came up with, uh, hopefully not just to get them to sleep, but also to teach them a bit about general relativity. I'm not going to sing it, by the way, because that would be embarrassing. I'm just going to read out the words. Uh, they used to say that time is absolute and space is flat, but Albert Einstein came along and changed all of that. General relativity, general relativity, space time is curved. Um, so this is the, key, the crucial thing about special about general relativity. You lose the idea of an absolute uh, time of an order of events, which is uh, which is given absolutely, uh, and space and it is no longer flat, and instead you have space time. It is curved. Um, the theory of general relativity has three parts. Um, um, it has a prescription. So this is a, a, a way to turn equations like Maxwell's equations from special relativity uh, into equations for general relativity. Okay. And um, people call this the um, comma to semicolon rule. Um, that's because physicists have a lot of imagination. Um, so this, this, this is an important part of general relativity and it tells you how to get equations that are useful. Um, but then um, another thing happens in general relativity. It turns out you need an extra 10 equations because uh, now you have this gravitational field that can vary. Uh, and, and these are the 10 equations are the field equations uh, that Einstein came up with in 1915. And here, uh, here they are uh, on, a, on a bag. Um, the particular version here also has uh, the cosmological constant. Um, <clears throat> And then finally, um, uh, there is an interpretation of general relativity. Um, and the interpretation is really interesting and, and, and one could talk about that for an hour, uh, anyway, uh, but I don't have time, of course. Uh, but the basic idea is that the only physically real properties in general relativity are those that are independent of the choice of coordinate system we use to describe the physics. This is very deep. So this was the theory of general relativity that Einstein came up with. <clears throat> and here, I, I, I have a flow chart. I, I don't expect you to look at all the details in this flow chart. Uh, over here at the bottom left, you have the three elements of, of general relativity. Over here, you have the old theories. And you can show that, um, that these elements, that, that the general relativity limits or approximates these old theories um, in appropriate circumstances. There's lots of mathematical structure here on the top right. 
There's various mathematical ideas that go into general relativity. Again, I don't expect you to uh, appreciate all of this. And then here on the top left, there's various principles, such as the equivalence principle, uh, that go into obtaining general relativity. So there's this interesting um, uh, sort of set of, of, of different types of uh, ideas that go into creating uh, general relativity. Okay, so that finishes the classical quest. And uh, if it hadn't been for the fact that um, quantum theory was starting to be discovered when um, Einstein wrote down his, um, his equations, you might have regarded the classical quest as the end of physics. You might just say, well, finally, we've done it. We've got it all sorted out. We can all go on and do something else. <clears throat> but um, that wasn't the case. Uh, already in 1915, people were starting to think about quantum theory. Um, and so what I wanted to do is talk about um, uh, the quantum quest. And this is the search for a theory of quantum gravity. Now, of course, there are many people who have been thinking about the problem of quantum gravity uh, for years. And uh, there's, uh, and there's a very established fields like uh, string theory, uh, loop quantum gravity, uh, people who are approaching that. Uh, the ideas I'm going to talk about are, are, are very tentative. Uh, but I thought that for a public lecture, it's interesting to see so ideas at a sort of tentative stage uh, in the development rather than um, uh, at the at the sort of at the final um, sort of uh, result. So, so I, I just want to give you that disclaimer. This is this is a very tentative approach. Okay. Well, quantum theory, unlike general relativity, uh, which was invented pretty much by Einstein, um, uh, quantum theory uh, was was developed by lots of different people. Uh, here are some of them. The, the people at the top are the old older guards. So Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein helped, uh, Max Planck. The people at the bottom are, um, are Wolfgang Pauli, Werner Heisenberg, and, and Erwin Schrodinger. Um, and um, the basic thing that makes uh, quantum theory strange is um, uh, what I'm going to call quantum indefiniteness. So uh, here's an example. You have a particle, and it can go through this here. It can go through the top along here. We can go through along the bottom like this. Okay, this particle can go one of those two ways. Uh, and when you look at this and when you study it carefully, you see that actually, even though the particle is just a single particle, if you look, you'll only find it in one place. In order to explain um, the behavior, what, what happens, uh, you have to imagine it goes both ways at once. So the particle doesn't have the definite property of only going one way. Uh, so we call it so we call it indefiniteness. It goes both ways. Um, and uh, in quantum physics, we write it like this. We say we have the particle goes along the top path plus the particle goes along the bottom path. Um, and you don't need to understand what that means. It's just a sort of technical way that um, this idea of indefiniteness is written down. And it's not the same as uh, in in the sort of world we're used to, it's not that we don't know whether the particle goes up or down. It's simply that there is no matter of the fact. It goes in some sense both ways at the same time. This is um, really crazy. Um, so here, uh, Schrodinger um, um, the, um, came up with uh, his equation, Schrodinger's equation. Here it is on a t-shirt. And um, uh, this, is, this, I believe, is a picture of him giving a public lecture in Dublin. Uh, in 1943. Um, uh, and um, Schrodinger realized that his equation can apply to any size of object, not just the small uh, quantum particles, but it can also apply to cats. And he imagined this situation where uh, you have a, a source of radiation, and um, if, the, um, if a, radioact a radioactive particle is emitted, uh, it will hit this device that will cause a bottle of poison to be broken. Uh, and so you imagine put it, you put this inside a box and you have a cat inside the box as well. And if the um, radioactive uh, device, uh, if, if, if the atom is released, then the cat will be dead. And if it doesn't, the cat will be alive. Uh, and if you wait for a short while, then there's, um, there's, um, it's, it's equally likely that the atom has um, has uh, decayed, has, has been released, uh, uh, and that it hasn't. So the cat will be both alive and dead at the same time. Uh, you'd write that like this, cat alive, 
plus cat dead. This seems a little bit crazy. Um, and um, um, to paraphrase what Newton said before, um, that body should be in two places at once, that cat should be alive and dead at once, is so great an absurdity that I believe no person who has, in philosophical matters, a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Um, well, that's absolutely right. And, um, and in reaction to this, there have been many attempts to uh, interpret um, uh, quantum theory. So there's lots of different ideas, many worlds, to Bory Bohm, the Copenhagen interpretation, uh, many more ideas. Uh, and when you look at these ideas, they are to some extent reminiscent of the attempts to um, come up with uh, explanations of Newton's theory of gravity and Maxwell's equations, all these ether-based attempts for something very similar uh, in spirit. And um, it makes you wonder, is there a, a different route? Instead of just trying to come up with an interpretation, uh, just like um, Newton and, and uh, Maxwell did for the physics that they were working on, is there a different way uh, to, 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 to solve this problem? Well, um, what I want to suggest is that we should instead uh, look at, the, um, at this problem, um, which is, um, you know, we have these two great uh, pillars of physics today, uh, general relativity and quantum theory, uh, the, the, they do not fit together. Uh, and we have the problem of quantum gravity, like I described, that we want to find a theory that approximates general relativity and quantum theory um, in appropriate limits. And this problem has a, has a lot in common with the problem that Einstein solved, the problem of relativistic gravity. So can we learn from Einstein? So here is the schema I showed you for general relativity. And what I want to do is take this schema and modify it slightly, mainly by inserting the word quantum uh, to this schema. OK, uh, is this likely to work? Um, that's, so that's the idea. Um, well, well, over here we have at the top, we have uh, the quantum equivalence principle. Um, and we have this idea of quantum coordinates. So I'm going to talk about those two boxes in particular. Um, OK. So but quantum theory and general relativity are, are both um, you know, amazing theories. And they each have conservative and radical uh, features. And I tried to represent that in this table here. So general relativity is conservative in that it's a deterministic theory. Um, and um, quantum theory is conservative in that it has fixed causal structure in the background. General relativity is radical in that the causal structure is not fixed. It's dynamical, like I talked about before. And quantum theory is radical in that it has indefiniteness. Um, so a cat can be alive and dead, a particle can be here and there at the same time. Uh, if you're trying to find a new fundamental theory um, that can uh, approximate both general relativity and quantum theory, then it would seem you'd need to find a theory uh, that can accommodate these radical features. We'd expect quantum gravity to be a probabilistic theory that has indefinite causal structure. And it's very hard to draw a picture or, uh, that represents indefinite causal structure. So what I did was I took this photograph. I think this is the front entry to the, the library at UCD, I believe. Um, and it has a clock there. And then I, I just blurred it. This is meant to represent indefinite causal structure. Um, so indefinite causal structure is, is a really radical idea. Because causal structure is about the pattern of before and after. So we could have uh, two events. A could be before B, and A could be after B. And if you have indefinite causal structure, then both of those things could be true at the same time. It could be true that A is before B, and also A is after B. And so these are both true. Um, and, and the question is, if you have this, how do we even do physics? 
how would we even start to do physics? Because most of our physics thinks about um, taking the situation at some initial time and evolving it forward in time. Um, but you wouldn't be able to do that if you can have indefinite causal structure like this. So this is something really quite uh, different. Well, here's an idea we borrow from Einstein. We want to take um, definite causal structure and treat it as an analog of inertial behavior. So here's Stephen Hawking in an inertial frame of reference. And here's the um, entrance to the UCD library, uh, 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 not blurred, representing definite causal structure. Uh, and at the same time, we want to treat uh, indefinite causal structure as an analog of non-inertial behavior. So there's Britney Spears in a non-inertial reference frame. Uh, and there's the blurry photograph of, UTC, uh, uh, of the front entrance. Um, okay. And then we take the equivalence principle, which said that there always exists a coordinate system with respect to which we have inertial physics in the local vicinity of any given point, and we change it uh, to what I'm going to call the quantum equivalence principle, which says that there always exists a coordinate system, sorry, there always exists a quantum coordinate system with respect to which we have definite causal structure in the local vicinity of any point. So this is taking uh, Einstein's, Einstein's idea about an equivalence principle uh, and trying to make it suitable for the problem of quantum gravity. Uh, and one thing I have to do is tell you what I mean by a quantum coordinate system. I'll do that later. Um, if, if this principle is correct, what it means is that you can choose a coordinate system so that in the vicinity of some point, so here in the center of this picture, you have definite causal structure. As you go away, the causal structure will become uh, indefinite, so kind of blurry. So I've represented that by having the clock in the middle is sharp, and the clocks as you go further away are, are blurry. Um, okay, so what are quantum coordinate systems? Well, they're based on a, an idea that goes back to Yakir Aharonov. Here's a picture of Yakir Aharonov, a very famous uh, physicist. And also in this photograph, you can see he may be the coolest physicist um, alive today. Um, and this goes back to the 1960s and 70s. And then there's also recent work uh, by Flaminia Giacomini and uh, co-authors, that's Flaminia, uh, and a, the study of quantum reference frames is the idea that actually any reference frame is itself a quantum object. Uh, and so you can think about transforming from one reference frame, which is represented by the quantum object, uh, to another. And very interesting things happen when you do that. So in one quantum reference frame, uh, a certain um, you, may, you may have um, some indefiniteness. And if you transform to another quantum reference frame, that indefiniteness may disappear. So you can find a way to transform away indefiniteness. Um, and so based on that idea, I, um, I came up with an idea of quantum coordinate systems, uh, which I'll try to explain. So here's the idea. We have a kind of quantum space. So it's consists, it's like normal space time. We have space and time. But then you also have another axis, which I'm calling the possibility axis. Um, and then you can stack different possibilities uh, along that possibility axis. So here's different possibilities represented by these different um, rectangles here. And on each of these um, rectangles, you can have different stuff happening. So here are some particles moving around. And, um, and if you have a quantum coordinate system, it identifies points between these different, um, between these different rectangles. So this point is identified as the same point as this one and the same point as this one. <clears throat> and um, so now we have quantum coordinates. These are the quantum coordinates. Um, and what you can do is you can transform this picture. I haven't drawn the transform picture, but you can move each of these um, rectangles. You can stretch them and 
squish them and you can rotate them and you can move them separately, independently of one another. Now, and when you do that, you can arrange so that the, um, if you have, you can arrange so that um, you have definite causal structure at a point and in the vicinity of a point. So this is something you can do by applying this kind of quantum uh, transformation. Okay, so, um, so here is uh, this schema again that I showed you. Uh, and um, here at the top, we're starting to come up with ideas. We have this notion, general notion of quantum coordinates. We have um, the quantum equivalence principle. Uh, and the program is to start to develop all these other objects here, quantum, uh, general quantum covariance, um, quantum tensor fields, and all, all these different things that appear uh, in general relativity. Uh, 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 as, as a way of working towards a, a theory of quantum gravity. Okay, so before I, I finish, it's, um, I, I'd like to um, uh, re return to this quote from Minkowski. So remember, he said, uh, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows. Only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Now, what's interesting is, uh, you know, at the time when he said that, it was still the case that you could have intervals that were definitely time-like, so they would be associated with time, uh, and, and intervals that were definitely space-like would be associated with space. So uh, special relativity and his version of special relativity didn't fully realize this vision that he came up with. But if you, um, if you take um, this idea of indefinite causal structure seriously, then you take Minkowski's vision one step further. So in quantum gravity, it seems there will not even be space-like or time-like intervals. Space and time really won't have an independent uh, reality. Um, uh, my, my opinion is that this is such a radical idea that it should be front and center uh, in our attempts to find a theory of quantum gravity. Um, and so, to conclude, um, uh, I think the, the conclusion really is that, of course, it's a very long road to get to quantum gravity. The, the problem has existed um, for almost 100 years or now, and uh, many people have worked on it. We haven't been successful. Uh, and what I'm proposing is that perhaps we can imitate uh, what Einstein did in developing general relativity uh, to help us get uh, solve the problem of quantum gravity. And I hope uh, that um, in doing this, we'll also solve some of the interpretational problems of quantum theory, just like Einstein was able to solve the interpretational problems of, of Newton's theory of gravity and of Maxwell's equations um, by thinking uh, deeply in a certain way. Perhaps uh, we can solve the interpretational problems of um, quantum theory um, by appealing um, to quantum gravity. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Lucien, for a, uh, a wonderful review and also a fascinating insight into the future of, of quantum gravity. So can I encourage people to uh, type questions into the, into the Q&A and I can, I can, uh, we can, Denjo and I can then pass those, those on. Might I start while people are doing that by asking you a question? Is your probability axis a real axis or is this complex? Is it relating to probability amplitudes or probability, probability um, classical probabilities? Yeah, so it's a good question. So I would imagine that the former, that it would be that each, each object that each of those sheets I showed you would have an amplitude associated with it. Um, and so correspondingly a phase associated with it. Um, yeah. That, that's that's the picture I have at the moment. Um, I mean, it's, it's something of a bit of a, a struggle for me because I think the best way of construing quantum theory is a, is of a, is a, as a theory of um, of probabilities, and, and you can write all of quantum theory down just in terms of probabilities without making any reference to amplitudes. And I, I prefer that point of view. However, uh, for the time being, uh, um, the, this quantum equivalence principle works in in the amplitude. Uh, picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
so we have some questions maybe um do you think the quantum mechanic that do you think the theory of quantum mechanics makes sense without classical measuring apparatus that's from brian dolan okay um thank you for the, the question um i mean this this is really a, one of the questions that people who come up with interpretations try to to, to make sense of um so um in in some interpretations like like the Manuel's interpretation and like the de Broglie bohm interpretation which are the different interpretations uh, you can indeed make sense of quantum theory without referring to measurement apparatuses you can describe measurement apparatuses uh, as quantum systems uh, with, with, within quantum theory um, um, but um, but the, pro the problem is that th those points of view I, I feel are, are kind of static they don't they haven't really led to progress uh in, in fundamental physics whilst whilst they, they they seem to go some direction in the way of solving the problems solving the the interpretation of problems of quantum theory they haven't led to any progress for example uh, in the theory of quantum gravity so um so i don't know there are other interpretations incidentally which take measurement apparatuses to be to be special in some way um and um in those interpretations um the um you know, uh, the, the, the world is in some sense dualistic. You have measurement apparatuses and people, and they're, they're on a different footing to quantum particles. So I, I don't know what the right the right approach is. Um, and my hope is that if we get a theory of quantum gravity, then then these interpretational questions will become clearer. Uh, and Peter Lynch wants to put you on the spot. He's, he asks, is string theory part of the answer or is it a dead duck? All right, so a, a lot of my, a lot of my uh, good colleagues here at Perimeter Institute are string theorists, and so I certainly wouldn't say it's a dead duck. Um, yeah, the, the truth is that I, I, I'm, I, I simply don't know string theory well enough um, to answer that. What, what I would say is that the, the kind of approach I'm taking here uh, isn't isn't in conflict with string theory or loop quantum gravity or any of the other approaches. This, this sort of techniques I'm developing can be applied uh, to those those various approaches. Um, so um, so um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, time will see. It could be right. And um, uh, Nikos Petropoulos, uh, he thanks you for an amazing presentation, and he's he asks if entanglement. Uh, he said, my question is, how would entanglement manifest in these quantum coordinates? Does it uh, put some restraints on how you can rotate these hyperslices or probability axes to identify causal points? I um, was thinking something like topological character knots, or yeah. um, maybe there's nothing special. Okay, That's so it's an, it's an interesting question. So. If I can just back up and describe entanglement from the point of view of this quantum reference frames as developed by Aharonov and um, and Giacomini, um, which is which is not quite the same as my work on quantum coordinate systems. Yeah, in that in that context, uh, you you can have situations where you have entanglement in one frame of reference in one quantum frame of reference. And you can go to another quantum frame of reference and the entanglement disappears. So entanglement becomes dependent on the frame of reference you're in, which is very strange for, for people like me who have spent our lives working on, on entanglement. Uh, you know, that, that entanglement should be a frame of reference dependent phenomena is quite strange. Um, in the context of the quantum coordinates that I was writing down, um, I, I, I don't see entanglement as, as an obstacle. Um, I mean, in, in, I have a paper uh, which you can find online on, on these quantum coordinates, and, and you can you can rotate. There's not there's not really any problem. You can rotate and squish and squash so that your different um, your different um, sort of your, the, the different sheets in that picture I showed you um, will will line up so you have definite causal structure at a point, and entanglement doesn't doesn't affect that. If I might ask, do you think uh, that quantum theory itself needs to be 
changed, that we need something, something beyond quantum. And uh, uh, because I think your uh, your picture is still very much in the in in the quantum uh, quantum world. Do we, how would you go about changing that? Okay, so let me just go to an earlier slide. Um, so if I can even go to an earlier slide than that. Um, okay, so if you look here at the schema for general relativity, and then the, the corresponding question there would be. Uh, do we need to change special relativistic field theories uh, when we go to general relativity? And the answer is yes. Uh, in general relativity, you have to make these changes to the equations of special relativity um, uh, um, using the minimal coupling, the, the comma to semicolon rule, and the equations you get are not the same, um, not predictively different from the equations of, 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 of special relativity. So there is this change, and the change is not noticeable if you're in flat space, but when you go into curved space, uh, it's a real thing. Um, and um, so then the question is, is there an analogous change that happens um, when you go to quantum gravity? And uh, I would hope the answer is yes, um, but you can see in terms of the schema, I'm quite a long way from, from developing an actual answer to that question. I'm really at the top of this with the quantum equivalence principle and quantum coordinates. And there's a lot more things that would need to be put in place to, to give a proper answer to that question. And um, Nosrat Jafari asks, is there any possibility uh, to not have quantum gravity? Maybe, gra maybe gravity does not need to be quantized. Do you have reasons to quantize gravity? Yeah, so, OK. Um, so there's a lot of discussion on this point and, and, and it continues uh, at the moment. So, so one reason that's given that you need to quantize gravity is that you can take a, a massive object and you can send it for an interferometer. Um, and um, and if, if the massive object is small enough, you'll still see interference. In fact, you know, an electron is something that has mass, uh, but when you send it for an interferometer, you, you do get um, quantum interference. Uh, and 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 the and and if 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 that particle were 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 somehow classical, if it were causing a classical um, gravity field, uh, then then you would expect that to cause what's called de decoherence. The, the electron, as it passed through the interferometer, would leave information in the gravitational field about which which way it went, uh, and so you would you would um, you would get. Um, you, you would get something different. Um, however, people have shown that it is in fact possible uh, to couple um, a, a sort of classical view of the gravitational field uh, with, with quantum phenomena like electrons passing through interferometers. Um, and um, so uh, Jonathan Oppenheim uh, uh, um, in, in London um, has, has, has done that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so it is an open field of research, and it's conceivable uh, that, uh, that that the theory that combines quantum and, and gravity will, in fact, be um, of that nature, be kind of hybrid. Um, my 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 hope is that it's not like that. My hope is that, um, that it will be more interesting, and that and your gravity will be quant will be in some way truly quantum. Can I maybe one, ask one more question? One, one of the issues we have with quantum gravity is that the effects at which we expect quantum gravity to be, to be important are at such crazy small time scales, small length scales, or at such crazy high energies that it's very hard to imagine experimental uh, evidence. Is there any chance that maybe there is a Schrodinger cat equivalent of indeterminate causal structures that will lead to a a large scale effect from these underlying quantum fluctuations? Are there any signatures we might hope to see? So, okay, so certainly you can imagine, and people are you know, working on experiments where you put a particle that's you know, relatively big, like um, order of the Planck mass, so sort of um, you know, like a, sort of a little particle of dust uh, in, into, a, into a quantum superposition and see if you can see uh, interference. Um, 
And so, I mean, I, I imagine at some point during the next 10 to 20 years, people will actually do that, do interference experiments like that with quite big um, objects. Um, and, you know, and, and those kinds of experiments would, would have a bearing on, on the question of indefinite causal structure. The problem from the point of view of gaining new empirical information is that there exists a, a version of quantum gravity you know, called linearized quantum gravity, where you, you, where, which, which works when you don't have uh, gravitational fields that are too strong, mm -hmm. um, that's perfectly capable of, of, of uh, accounting for you know, the predictions you'd expect to see in those kinds of experiments. So while those experiments would be interesting to do, uh, they're unlikely to lead to you know, new empirical information that would be helpful in verifying you know, uh, sort of a, a substantially new theory of quantum gravity. Um, so my, 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 my hope is, is, is something different. You know, um, <clears throat> um, sometimes you need the physical theory in front of you uh, to know what predictions it would make and, and, and to be able to look for interesting novel predictions. Um, and um, and perhaps when we have a, a, a good working theory of quantum gravity, um, we we can start to make predictions based on that that theory. Uh, and indeed, there's there's a there's a big field of you know phenomenological quantum gravity people who are looking for that that kind of thing. So we have one more question here from from Nikos. Could points in an expanding space-time, say the static patch of the of De Sitter, separated by a cosmological horizon, be seen as points that in one frame are causally related in some way, while in the other in a different one? Um, I, 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 I suspect not. I think the causal relationship would be the same in both cases. Because I think what you're describing is really a, a classical situation where there isn't there isn't something like a quantum superposition uh, there. So I, I th think um, in that case it would be um, it would be the same in in any any quantum frame of reference. Um, do you have an opinion as to whether space time should be discrete or continuum? Um, Troy, another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, I mean, one one thing that this approach I've described doesn't do is it, it doesn't um, it it doesn't show you how to get the Planck units in. So the um, <clears throat> the Planck length, which is a very small length associated with quantum gravity, Planck time, Planck mass, is a very small um, quantities um, <clears throat> you can calculate from the fundamental constants that are expected to appear. In a theory of quantum gravity, and and I haven't shown you how how they would appear, um, and so I really don't I really don't know um, what the way forward there is. Um, in terms of fundamentally, I mean, you, even if you have those units in your theory, it could still fundamentally be continuous. Um, and yeah, I, I I don't have a strong opinion there. I think whatever works is is the best way the best way forward. Um, yeah, I mean the, the the program I've shown you here looks like it is more would be more in support of a continuous sort of uh, space time, but uh, you know, we shall have to wait and see. And we, perhaps one last question, uh, and we can let people go and have their their dinner or supper. I see. Um, it's. I suppose. Uh, do you have an intuitive? I promise. Do you have? It's promising to be a last question. Do you have an intuitive description of a black hole, or Big Bang singularity in your description? And uh, Nikos is thanking you for an amazing talk. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, we're, I mean, an interest. I, I haven't thought about a, a black hole from the point of view of. Um, of these quantum coordinate systems, um, but it would be an interesting subject to think about because you, you know it, it classically you have these singularities where fields become become infinitely strong, and um, and uh, it's you know often been thought that maybe with quantum theory you you could sort of make things a bit fuzzy and get rid of those uh, singularities. Um, 
So it would be an interesting project to think about whether these quantum coordinates could be a way of removing the, the singularities. Uh, at this point, I have no idea uh, how to solve that kind of problem, um, how, how to start investigating it, but I think it's a very interesting question. Um, will we take this very last question? It's, uh, Einstein used Riemannian geometry to develop his uh, theory. Are there any special mathematical frameworks for describing indefinite causal structure? So that's the kind of thing I, I want to think about. Um, so, um, and at this stage, I, I don't have I don't have that. Um, so um, you can think about um, in in general relativity, uh, which is this one here. Um, you can um, you can think about curvature um of, of space time you can think about it as being um to do with um i'm trying to think of a way to say this non-technically it, it, it curvature relates to the number of um of um parameters you have left over um after you you take the second derivative of the metric okay so let's say that differently as you move away from a point you have a certain amount of freedom in how space can can curve and um and 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 these mathematical objects capture that freedom they they they, they quantify that freedom um and so the hope is that in the in the quantum case you can try to do the same thing so as you move away from a point although you have definite causal structure you, you can make it so you have definite causal structure at, at 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 the point and in the immediate vicinity as you move away as you get a bit further away you'll start to have some freedom uh, and you'll have quantities associated with that so the idea is to try and pursue a very similar strategy uh, as as in the, the Riemannian case uh, uh, to to build these quantities, but I haven't done that yet. This is this is very much um, a project that I'm I'm thinking about. Thank you very much, uh, Lucien. That's been a fascinating uh, hour and fifteen minutes or twenty minutes. Thank thank you indeed. Yeah, it was a, a, a masterful review of of how history has brought us to where we are and fascinating insights as to how you're now pushing pushing the frontiers so thank you very much indeed uh, for thank you it's, it's been it's been a pleasure yeah. much appreciated um, uh, we can i'll, I'll stop sharing i will stop the recording i think i can Thank mm -hmm. you.